I dedicate this message to every one of these graduates, to every one of us in the room that lives with the conviction that God has a future and a hope. You could be saying, God, help me to be the best parent in this next season. You may be developing or leading a business. You may have a business idea that's stirring in you and and you're ready to go for it. Any number of stories that will find the relevance of this message today. Because I'm talking about the fact that God has a mission for you. And so the message is, how does God put your name and my name on a mission? That takes us to Exodus chapter 3, starting at verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the far side of the wilderness, and he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Let me pause for just a moment and point out that at this point, Moses has been in the desert because he went there from having committed murder. And when God shows up in his fiery presence, he does not say murderer, murderer, but Moses, Moses. God knows our sin, but will only call us by our name. Satan knows our name, but will only call us and identify us by our sin. I want to thank God today that we have a God who by his incredible grace can handle the issues of the past and out of that same grace has realigning power that out of his fiery presence, he will still put our name on a mission to make a difference in this world. If you're thankful for a God who can forgive and still make you useful to the kingdom, would you give him praise for that today? How grateful we are. That's, that's all of us in the room, are people of a second chance and a third chance. Uh, if you're like me, I'm up, I'm up around 20 to 30th chance, so thank God for his grace. Amen? Now, continue with me. Let's go to verse 7. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. Watch this next verse. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. This portion started with God saying that he was coming down that he was going to make a rescue. So the mission in this text is the rescue of Israel that had been held captive for over 400 years as slaves in Egypt. But God says, I'm coming down, but I'm sending you. The mission is to bring them out, Exodus, the exit. But Moses, I'm putting your name on this mission. To that, Moses asked the usual question, verse 11, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? To that, we get God's timeless response. God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me 
to you. Moses had the best education. He was raised in Pharaoh's home, so there was no limit to the investment that could be made to educate him. He had the best. He had 40 years of life skill development in the desert. Both the education and the skill set would be used and necessary in this monumental mission where they, he'd be leading the people out through the very wilderness where he's been for many years. Yet what God is reminding us of in this passage, that God is the God of salvation. And God is the God of deliverance. And God is the God of healing. God is the God of breakthrough and freedom. And on our best day, those of us who labor, only labor in vain apart from the eternally existent, all-powerful God. Moses, it's not about who you are. It's about who I am. This was never to say your education didn't matter. Your responsibility to be at your best, not saying that doesn't matter. That is very important. But on your best day, it's not going to change Pharaoh's heart. It's not going to open up a Red Sea. So the question that you're asking is the wrong question. And so to that question, I'll just remind you that I am God. This mission starts with me. This mission is for me, but I'm going to put your name on it and make a difference in the world through you by my power. <laughs> Chapter four, verse one. Moses answered, well, what, what if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. Now you know that in the wilderness, he had been taking care of his father-in-law's sheep. So the staff is referring to his shepherd's staff. And right after this, God says to him, throw the staff on the ground. He does, and it turns into a snake. This next part, if that's not like amazing enough, the next part, God says, now Moses, pick it up. I'm good if God says, now Moses, kill it. And, and I, I just have to tell you, anybody's like, but it's a garden snake. It, it, we need the, no, if it's a snake, it should die. Thank you, thank you, thank you. If it's a snake, it dies. I'll probably get emails about that. You just send them to, to Kelly at the assembly.org. <laughs> he picks it up. And then it turns back into a staff. God then says, put your hand in your cloak. And he pulls it out and his hand has leprosy. God says, put it back. He does, he pulls it out and he's healed. He's made whole. God says, draw water from the Nile. He does. And he says, now pour it out and it turns into blood. And so what, what God is showing him is what's so important for you and for me that Moses is about to go stand before Pharaoh, who is about as evil a taskmaster as had ever lived. And when he leads these people, millions of them, out of the grip of Pharaoh, very soon they'll be at a Red Sea. Pharaoh will harden his heart, send his, his most incredible warriors on 600 chariots to capture Israel and to bring them back. So they'll have the enemy behind them and the Red Sea in front of them. And God is saying it's in moments like that that you're going to have to have a God who can do the supernatural. It's in moments like that. There's no level of believability that's going to cause Pharaoh to let the people go or to open up the Red Sea. Moses, this is not about your credibility. This is not about your believability. This is about a sovereign, awesome, 
all-powerful God who can make a way where otherwise there is no way. So when God puts your name on a mission and you're tempted to say, but what about my credibility? It's about his capability to and through you as you just make yourself available. All you have to do is be available. I shared at the Summit Christian Academy graduation Friday night, and I referenced the prayer of Jabez. Israel was in a crisis, and Ezra writes about 600 names, and he extracts Jabez's name from the list. And we know Jabez because of the prayer around his life. He prayed, God, would you bless me, and would you bless me indeed? And the blessing there means God pushing you forward. There's a version of, by, uh, of scripture that says, God, will you prosper me? And many people take that word prosper and they attach it only to financial matters. But the word blessing there, God, would you bless me indeed? It's about God, will you do what only you can do? Will you push me forward? Lord, if I'm here, but by applying myself and preparing myself, that's education, and by getting the right people speaking into my life. Very important things. If I go from here to here, that's awesome. But God, I want you to push me forward into that place where only you can take me to a self that otherwise I will never be, a self that is greater than myself because your blessing is resting on my life. The kind of destiny that God has for you is no less needy of God's power than Moses going to Pharaoh. You and I say in church that if we get a vision from God, it's going to be bigger than us. Or else it's not God's vision. We say it like this, if you and I can pull it off and we don't need God, then that's not a vision from God. Because God's vision will always be bigger than us, thus requiring us to have to have the blessing of God for it to ever happen. So that we're living a life like Moses where when the Red Sea parts, he's like, this is only God. Only God, only God could cause Pharaoh to relinquish and the Israelites to make their exit. Only God could open the Red Sea and then collapse it on Pharaoh and his enemies so they couldn't pursue the Israelites anymore. So I'm presenting here in this context, we're asking God to bless us, not to give us a little bit more money. We're asking God to push us into a zone where he's doing the unimaginable beyond what we could even ask or think that the blessing of God would rest on us and we would be walking around going, look at this, only God. God can do this. The mission that has your name on it is designed to take you to a place that unless he does work, the work won't get done. But if he blesses you, then it's going to be exceedingly abundantly above anything you could ever ask or imagine. Thank you, Jesus. So Moses, he's having this interaction. He says, uh, pardon me, verse 10. Lord, I've never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. At this point, you could just think God's like, you know what? Maybe I made a mistake. I'm the omniscient, all-knowing God, but maybe I missed it here. Moses, go back to the sheep, man. But no, no, God, God, in the very next verse says, Moses, who made your mouth? So now put it into the context of what's flowing from the fiery presence of God. Moses, you've had the best education. And if you were the most eloquent, do you think your eloquence is going to change the heart of Pharaoh? When you get to the Red Sea and his army coming behind you, 
Do you think it's your eloquence that is going to cause the Red Sea to roll back on the left and the right? The whole issue is just using what we have. The disciples spent every day with Jesus. There's a certain time frame that most every writer in those first four gospels will talk about. They spent the whole day with Jesus. He's opening blind eyes. He's causing people to be healed so that they could walk and they had never walked. At the end of the day, Jesus retreats with his disciples, but people find out where Jesus was and they, they crowd around him. And the scripture says that Jesus just continued to do many miracles. It's toward the end of the day and Jesus looks at his disciples and he said, now they're hungry and I want you to feed them. And these disciples who have been watching miracles all day say, how? You know the story. He says, well, what do you have? And they got five loaves and two fish. And one version says five loaves and two small fish. Only time fishermen have been honest in their life right there. <laughs> like you've been, I've been fishing like two, like it was really a minnow, but that thing was a wall hanger. Here two, like, and what they're doing is they are despising what they do have. Moses is so focused on himself that he's despising. Okay, so he's not eloquent, but he can talk. And he's, he's missing that on his best day, he's not equal to the challenge. Five loaves and two fish teaches us that if we'll just take what we have, which is not enough, and give it, make it available to God, God will take what is not enough because we will never be enough up against the vision God has for us. We will always be a sack lunch in the face of the opportunity and the mission that has our name on it. So it's not enough. But if we despise who we are, the talent we do have, the time we do have, the resources we do have, then we don't give what we do have to God. When we do give it to God, he places a blessing on it like he did that sack lunch. A miracle of multiplication happens. Then the disciples go and they disperse the food and everybody ate until they were full and there were 12 baskets left over. So what wasn't enough became enough and even more for one reason. The blessing of God settled in on it. And if you and I are gonna fulfill the mission that has our name on it, our requirement is not to despise who we are, not to despise what we have, but to say, if you can use anyone, you can use me. I'll give you my strengths and my weaknesses. I'll give you all, all my limitations because on my best day, I can't change anybody's heart, forgive their sin, free them from addiction, cause them to overcome brokenness, so God, I'm just going to give you what I do have and I'm going to believe you to put a blessing on it and take what's not enough and make it enough and even more. But I'm slow of speech. Notice what we've just seen is Moses entering an insecurity storm from the time God said, I'm putting your name on a mission. This insecurity storm unfolds. I've been in those. And I see a pattern here in Exodus that I think can help all of us. God never answers one question that Moses asks. Who am I? God doesn't entertain that. He doesn't say, well, you're the well-educated, desert survival skill 
graduate. Let me tell you why it's you, Moses, and not anyone else. I mean, look at you, Moses. You're on Facebook. You're so much better than everybody else. Uh, He doesn't compare him. He doesn't talk about his gift mix. He doesn't talk about his education. Because, hey, Moses, here's how you come out of an insecurity storm. Get your eyes off of yourself and put your eyes on me. Because this mission starts with me and it's for me. I'm just good enough to include you and put your name on it and then be the power you're going to need, be the strength, come on somebody, the strength you're going to need, the help you're going to need. The miraculous is about, I just showed you through the staff in your hand and the water from, I just showed you where the power's coming from. I just need you to be a vessel. I just need you to be available. Through the whole dialogue, God never indulges his insecurity so as to prop up his arrogance or his pride or his self-esteem. God only indulges his sovereignty. I am who I am, and I am sending you. It is not your credibility, it's mine. It's not your capability, it's mine. I'm the only one capable of taking these prisoners, these slaves, and bringing freedom. I'm not only going to take them out of Egypt, I'm going to take Egypt out of them. I am the one who is able. I just need you to be available. The storm of insecurity passes when we just say, you can have me, you can have my strengths, my weaknesses, you can have my past, you can have my future, you can have everything I am, you can have it all. Lord, if you can use anyone, you can use me. I will be willing to let you be God. I'll be faithful, you be God. I'll go, you be God. I'll step out like David and say, let's take on the giant because I'm no match for the giant, but the battle is not mine. The battle is the Lord's. And David said, this day, God, God will give you over into my hands. God just needs somebody that will let him be God. In this day, where it's constant comparison. The enemy would love for you to spend your time looking at all that you're not and then despising what you're not. Despising, therefore, who you are when that's all God has ever needed. He's never needed you to be someone else. He just needs you to be you and for you to be available. When God puts your name on a mission, it starts with you saying, here I am. Worship team, if you'll come, because this is a message not just taught, but caught. I want the Lord to really carefully help us to respond because I felt a a deep conviction about this message. And I feel something specific in this room. Somebody's going to start a business out of this service. Somebody's going to go next level out of this service. Somebody's going to take a step of faith that you've been hesitant about because of this service. That's the significance of of a sacred moment in the presence of God. I stand before you only by what you have seen in this text today. No other way but God. Only God could have me here. Only God. It's very interesting to me that we make it so complicated.
When I was in high school, I didn't apply myself. I made average grades. My parents said to me, if you bring a D home, life will change as you know it. My brother was top of the class and I came along and this school had all the teachers he had. I would take a test and I have one teacher I remember, she always looked over her glasses and I took that test, she said, are you Phil's brother? There was so much red on that paper, you'd have thought it was bleeding. It was like crying out to God. It wasn't a capability problem, it was a responsibility. I wasn't taking responsibility. I would go to my teachers and say, what do I have to make on this test to keep a C? Or how low can I make on this test and not have a D? And I was so wrong for not giving God my best. And then when it came time to go to college, I felt, a, you have to understand from age 13, I felt a definite call to ministry. I knew I was going into the ministry. I didn't know how it would look. I just, out of the fire of God's presence as a 13 year old, I knew God had put my name on a mission. Now, I wasn't taking responsibility for my part. And, and I was just coasting through. I could study for a test from my car to my classroom and pass the test. So when I went to college, I entered college on academic probation. The college I went to, they said, look, if you don't have above a 3.0 after this first semester, you can't stay. And that's the bottom line. You can't be in student government. Kind of gave the list of all the things I couldn't do. And I felt so insecure because my study habits were, does anybody have notes? Can I see your notes? And I would study on the way to class. And I had a teacher one time say, do you realize how, how much you can comprehend if you would ever just become responsible with that? It could really serve you. And to this day, preaching without notes is because when I go over something, just a couple of times, I got it. When I'm studying for a sermon, a book I've read seven years ago, if I'm studying and and I get to a part of a message, God will show me. I can remember the page I was reading. I can remember the phrases. I can remember where that book was in my library. It's, it's, it's just the Lord. So I made great grades in that first semester, but I was so insecure. But at that college, I would see these people come and preach at our chapel. and. Students, back in the day before iPhones, we would carry pictures in what's called a wallet. And you just kind of turn. We'd have pictures made. and That's back when we went to school every day in a carriage, horse-drawn carriage. We also, at times, would carry pictures of, like, star athletes, baseball cards. We would tell about the athlete and... In my wallet were the three pictures of my three favorite preachers. I said, God, that's what I want to do, but I can't do that. They would speak at my school, and I'd be at the altar going, oh, God, your presence is moving. And so I'd be so blessed, but then I'd walk away in an insecurity storm. And so what I'm telling you today God never approached me as the comforter to coddle my focus on myself. He approached me and said, I've got a mission. I felt like the rug had been pulled out from under me. And God said, it has. And until you get up with your eyes on me and off of yourself, I'd say things like this to myself, I'm not smart enough. I don't have enough charisma. I'm not funny enough. I'm not tall enough. That's still true to this day. 
And, and so I was just in this, if I could do that, if I could be that, because I entered the university I attended, I went in four weeks before it started, I shifted from one university to that one. The only place they had, I was on the hall with all the football players. I felt like everybody was a giant. Um, so I, and I love athletics and, and I just think, man, what'd it be like to be that person? The quarterback for Evangel University went on to be the strength and conditioning coach for the Arkansas Razorbacks, the greatest school in college sports. <laughs> Look at Arkansas. Hallelujah. Who picks me? And this guy, you know, he, he, He's got this great personality. He's athletic. I'm just like, man, what? And I lived in this, this comparison. And the Lord said, you're on your face before me. And if you really want to fulfill this mission, you will get up and quit saying, but look at who I am. And Lord, I'm not eloquent. And Lord, I'm not, I'm not. You get up talking about who I am and what I can do. And by my senior year, I'm preaching almost every weekend at a different church. Those three people became mentors in my life. See, when you're intimidated and insecure, you will admire somebody, but because you don't see that you, you won't approach them to help you because you're too insecure to say, would you speak into my life? And every one of those people that I thought were the ultimate, they talked to me about their struggles and their perception and how they had to yield to God. They talked about, to me about how they crafted a sermon, how they gave leadership. And it's like some of you right now would approach somebody and say, speak into my life, but you're intimidated by your own insecurity. You're in this insecurity storm. So I, I don't, I'm not here today say, Oh, look at how sharp you are. Look at how tall you are. Look at how in shape you are. Look at how gifted you are. Put all of that aside. God has a mission with your name on it. And if you will adjust your focus to him, he will show you what real credibility and what real capability is all about. And in your weakness he is strong yes he is I feel a fire in my soul that I felt when I was 13 that I felt in those university days I feel, I feel a fire out of the fire of God's presence. He wants to put your name on a mission. Will you stand with me, everyone? And as you stand, why don't you just close your eyes in the presence of God. If you're here saying, I want to be the best mom I can be. I want to be the best dad I can be. If you're saying, I want in this next season as a young adult, I want to be at my best. If you're saying, I'm in an insecurity storm and, and I'm ready to turn my focus, to realign my perspective I'm about to give an altar call and this is an altar call for somebody who says I want my name on a mission this is for somebody who's about to start a business or you've started one and there's another step of faith it's time to take it this is for a student that's feel a, you feel a, a call a call but the next thought is how all you're not come and get on your face before God and say when I get up from seeking God, my eyes will be on him and not on myself. I'm not going to compare myself. I'm going to be identified and defined by the one who loves me, the one who made me, and the one who has called me. Faithful is he who has called you, who will also do it. He watches over the call he's given you. He will perform it. He will perform it. Take it from me. If you'll trust God, he'll take you places you never dreamed. You'll meet people you never thought you'd get to talk to. Take it from me. If you'll trust him, he'll put an anointing on you. And you will not just be enough. You'll be more than enough. Because it's not about you. It's about him. 
Who's getting stirred right now? Who feels the call from the fire of God's presence? If that's you, start coming. Start coming right now. Get to this altar as quickly as you can. This is an altar call to say, I will be available. I make myself available for the supernatural mission of advancing the kingdom of God. Have your way today, Lord. Have your way today, Lord. I want this team to lead us. Sing it, declare it. And if you feel the presence, you come, you come. 